Hello there, and welcome back to the channel. Mad Mike here, and today we are going to be starting the first video in the series Journey to Endgame. Uh, and we're going to be starting in chronological order, so we will be going with the first film in the MCU from that perspective, which is Captain America, the first Avenger. Uh, now, this was a movie that came out in 2011. Uh, it was directed by Joe Johnson who does a really, really good job with this movie. He's very good with uh, 40s and 30s style period pieces. Uh, I enjoy that about him. He also did The Rocketeer, which is another movie that I, I think uh, I, is definitely worth a watch uh, based off a comic book series by the same name. But uh, back to First Avenger, you know, we have, uh, first we have Chris Evans uh, as uh, Steve Rogers uh, and or Captain America. And... Uh, when Chris Evans, a lot of people remember back in 2011 when Chris Evans was kind of announced for this role, a lot of people uh, were not really high on the choice. They thought it was kind of strange considering that uh, Chris Evans had played uh, Johnny Storm in the previous uh, Fantastic Four movies. And a lot of people uh, didn't really have much faith. And uh, the, the thing about the Fantastic Four movies was that they really weren't... Uh, they weren't really received very well. I mean, the first one was okay, and then the second one, Rise of the Silver Surfer, was not received very well. So people were kind of shaky on whether or not Chris Evans could pull off the serious nature of Captain America. Um, and thankfully enough, uh, Marvel had faith in him, and he's done an amazing job uh, since then. But uh, moving forward from that, uh, we have... Uh, Haley Atwell, who plays Peggy Carter, and uh, Peggy Carter is an MI6 agent uh, fr who is working with the Allied forces on the Super Soldier Project, and uh, she's also uh, the love interest for Captain America in the film, uh, even though they really don't uh, play it up too, well, I shouldn't say they don't play it up too much, they do, but they keep it as like kind of like a tension type of thing, like almost like they both kind of want it, but they don't pursue it until like until it's basically until it's too late um and she would also get her uh an, uh a television series of her own called agent carter which lasted for two seasons uh that takes place after the events of captain america the first avenger so uh then you have uh hugo weaving who plays the red skull uh who's the main antagonist uh and he he does a really good job at that he um you know <laughs> You kind of expect him to put on a set of sunglasses throughout half of it. Say, do you know what you're doing, Mr. Anderson? You know, you kind of you kind of feel like he's going to do that, but he does uh, he does play the role relatively well. He pulls off the German accent, um, and it uh, it is believable. And the makeup actually they do for the Red Skull is very very good. I thought that was that was relatively good. They do give off the uh, the shape of like like the misshapen nose and stuff like that. They do a very good job at kind of recreating uh, what he looks like in the comic books. Uh, and then you also have uh, for some other side characters, you have Sebastian Stan who plays Bucky Barnes, and they have made some changes uh, from the comic books, which make a bit more sense um, when you look at the MCU because in the comics, obviously Bucky was uh, Captain America's kid sidekick. Um, and in this, uh, he has been turned into somebody who is the same age as Captain America. Um, so it's a bit different, but you can kind of understand why, because you don't want a 13-year-old fighting in World War II. That's kind of strange. Um, but Sebastian Stan does a really good job, and it provides this kind of interesting dynamic between Steve Rogers and Bucky, where Bucky has always kind of been this big brother type of figure. Uh, you know, he's always been bigger and stronger than Steve. And he's kind of always protected him because Steve gets bullied a lot because he's smaller and he doesn't really take any crap from people. He doesn't like, and he says it in the thing, I don't like bullies, um, which is a major part of his character. And there's a really great scene uh, in a movie theater where there's a, uh, a guy who is in the theater and he's, screen he's yelling at the, uh, at the film screen when they have a, uh, it's a war reel up. It's a news reel for uh, World War II. And, uh, He's yelling for them to start cartoons or whatever at the film reel. Because back in the back in the day, they used to if you were in a movie theater, they'd have a few different reels. They'd have a news reel, and they'd have a uh, a cartoon, and then a feature film and stuff like that. So it wasn't the same as today because uh, you know you didn't have television back then. All you had was radio. So uh, he starts yelling, and Steve Rogers tells him to shut up. And so they step outside, and Steve Rogers gets the living crap beaten out of him. But there's this really great scene where uh it, and again this is something that's like brought up in future films where 
Steve is kind of, he's cornered in this alleyway. He gets punched. He like kind of uh, falls onto this trash can and he grabs the trash can lid and uses it as a shield. And obviously that's supposed to be an anagram for what he would be later, which is the Captain America shield. And he says, I can do this all day. And uh, the guy then proceeds to just rip the trash can lid out of his hand and and punches him again until Sebastian Stan shows up and uh, beats the crap out of him and then kicks him away. But it does set that up. And there's a few scenes uh, early on in the film that kind of set up uh, Steve Rogers. That that scene specifically sets up Steve Rogers and Sebastian Stan and Steve Rogers' relationship. But uh, we're uh, Steve Rogers and uh, Bucky. Uh, but the the scenes that where we see Steve Rogers kind of get all of his character moments are really, for the most part, are really early on in the film. Um, and the, the first one is actually his introductory scene, which is really good because that's what you need to do with a character when you introduce them. You need to kind of introduce them at their base. You want to kind of know that character uh, right when you, right, the first scene that you see that character, you should be kind of hooked. And at the same time, you should be, kind of introduced to what that character's base values are. And the first part of it is Steve Rogers is actually in line, uh, ready to get a physical in order to be drafted. And he's talking to another guy who, next to him, they're both reading newspapers. You don't really see Steve Rogers. He's behind the newspaper. He's talking to this other guy. And um, there's an article uh, in the newspaper about a bunch of uh, about a bunch of people that died in a battle. And uh, one of the guys says, makes you think twice about enlisting, huh? And Steve Rogers just goes, nope, and proceeds to push da- put down the uh, newspaper and walk forward. And at this point, you see that, you know, Steve Rogers is really scrawny. He's tiny. He almost looks like he's emaciated uh, or sickly. You know, they make him look like he's about 90 pounds. And that's the other thing is the special effects in this movie. And I know I said this about the Red Skull, but Steve Rogers and his his body the way that they make him look in the early part of this film. It is so believable. And I honestly can't even tell how the hell they did it. Unless they somehow grafted Chris Evans' head onto like an, an emaciated 10-year-old's body. Uh, but it looks amazing. And I, I, you know, I credit to the people that did that. And, you know, this is all the way back in 2011, but you can't see a damn thing. It looks amazing. Um... But just going past that, uh, then you go into, you know, that the after that scene, you find out that Steve Rogers has been faking his name uh, in various places to try and get past the draft board and uh, and get drafted into World War II. And he's been doing this multiple times. And he's been turned down every single time because he has health problems um, and because uh, I guess they, I think at one point they mentioned he has asthma. They said he can't be because he has asthma and a few other things. Uh, so what winds up happening is, is that, after this point, uh, the story kind of moves forward, but there's a couple other scenes that are really early on that kind of establish Steve Rogers. So you have the, the draft scene, and then you also have uh, another scene where Steve Rogers is, uh, this is at uh, what was the Stark Expo, and you saw that in Iron Man 2 again, uh, where Tony Stark reopens the Stark Expo, which is like this big in, in invention, uh, like almost like a theme park. Uh, and Howard Stark, uh, a young Howard Stark, who's played by Dominic Cooper, um, is doing this. Uh, and it's like the first annual one. It just opened. Uh, again, this is the 40s. And uh, there's this little exhibit where you get to see, oh, you get to be the face of a soldier. And uh, basically it's this uh, almost like a mirror window and you can see through it and there's a uh, there's a, a, a cutout almost. It's a it's a mannequin uh, where there's a helmet and there's uh, a, a suit or they, a military uniform, but there's no face. So when the light goes on, you see your own face projected onto the mannequin's face so you can make believe that you are the soldier. And, uh, you know, Steve Rogers goes up to it and he's so short that when the light turns on, his face actually just gets... Um, uh, projected into the mannequin's chest. And it, again, it's a really interesting scene about him just feeling so low on himself that he can't do anything. And it, it's it's uh, a reoccurring theme early on in the film that like he just feels like he is a useless thing and he doesn't know what to do. And he just desperately wants to do something, but he, he can't do anything. Um, and after that, Stanley Tucci, uh, who plays... Uh, Dr. Abraham Erskine, uh, he, he gives him a chance. And uh, this is when we get to the next few scenes that kind of establish the Steve Rogers character. And this is also where he meets Peggy Carter, uh, who would become his love interest later on. Is uh, 
there's two scenes during the the training montage which they have a whole, whole training program where they bring Steve Rogers and a bunch of other recruits in uh, to train for the super soldier program and one of them is uh, with uh, Stanley Tucci's character and uh, Tommy Lee Jones character Colonel Phillips where Colonel Phillips and and, and uh, Dr. Eskin are arguing uh, about who should be the choice from the recruits uh, to be given the super soldier serum. And everybody said, and uh, basically Tommy Lee Jones uh, points out the, the biggest guy, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but uh, the biggest guy in the group. And uh, Stanley Tucci points out Steve Rogers and said that he is the clear and obvious choice. And um, Tommy Lee Jones says, you know, they, they go back and forth, and basically Stanley Tucci says because he has a good heart because he's not a bully. And uh, Tommy Lee Jones says, when in a war takes more than just a good heart, when in a war takes guts. And I don't know why you have a box of fake grenades for whatever goddamn reason, other than something that's plot relevant. But Tommy Lee Jones takes a grenade out of a box that's next to him on a truck. He pulls the pin and pops the spoon on it, which means the grenade is active. And then he throws it into the crowd of soldiers and yells, grenade. Now, uh, and they, uh, none of the soldiers realize this is a fake grenade. None of them know. Except for Tommy Lee Jones, and somehow I, 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 the audience doesn't even know. Even though you can probably guess that because, you know, you're not going to kill Captain America off, you know, five minutes into the, uh, or 45 minutes into the movie. So, everybody else scatters except for Steve Rogers. Steve Rogers jumps on the grenade and clutches himself around it and waves at everybody else around him to, to, to get away before it explodes. And this, again, just kind of proves Steve Rogers' character is he is willing to sacrifice himself for others. And uh, a line that he says later on, he's willing to lie down on the wire and let the other guy crawl over him. That's what he's willing to do. And it's one of those great moments uh, where it, it, it's an iconic moment uh, for him. And uh, then you see there, there's one more moment in the training mo in the uh, training section where uh, Steve Rogers has uh, they, they're doing this uh, this run. It's supposed to be a, a one uh, I think it's one kilometer or one mile. Uh, where it's supposed to be running, and they they reach the halfway point, which has this little flagpole on it. And the uh, drill instructor says that if they climb the the pole and they get the flag, they get to ride back uh, in the jeep with uh, Peggy Carter. And uh, they, all of the soldiers try and climb up the thing and they can't get it. And Steve Rogers realizes that the flagpole is uh, is not stationary. It's held with a linchpin at the bottom. So he pulls the linchpin out, the flagpole falls down, he grabs the flag, and then proceeds to jump in the Jeep and gets a ride back. And it just kind of proves that, uh, again, Steve Rogers, even though physically he is not up to par with many of the other recruits, mentally he is far beyond them. Uh, because none of them came up with the idea to, to do that, even though it seems kind of obvious when you think about it uh, for more than five seconds. Um, but it does, it does again, kind of help uh, emphasize his character, where even though physically he is not uh, as strong as a normal man, mentally he is, in terms of his peers, he is far beyond them. Um, and really we don't see a whole lot more development with him until afterwards, uh, but, but this, this establishes his base. He's relatively smart. Uh, he doesn't give in to bullies. He doesn't give in to people that want to hurt others. He wants to protect people. He wants to fight for so that people don't have to get hurt. And he's unwilling to allow other people to fight his battles for him. Or he, he, he genuinely does not want that to happen. And... You know, we travel... We, we go through the movie with him, and we really kind of see that... Uh, Johann Schmidt, who's uh, the Red Skull, is really the polar opposite of him in many ways. Uh, and uh, Stanley Tucci, uh, his character, kind of alludes to this during the film, where he's really, uh, you know, Captain America is, he's humble, uh, you know, he, he's kind, he's gracious, uh, you know, he's not, he, he's not, he's not like a Tony Stark, he's not like a snarky guy, he's not going to sit there and insult you with words or anything like that. You know, if there's a disagreement, he's going to punch you in the face, that's what's going to happen. Uh, but Johann Schmidt is, uh, but, uh, but Johann Schmidt is kind of the opposite of Captain America in the sense that he's just brutal and violent and he just wants to kill and maim and amass power. 
And, uh, you know, it's kind of the classical interpretation of, uh, you know, a, a comic book villain and a comic book hero, but it works in this sense because the movie is very simplistic in the way that it portrays itself. It doesn't try to give you any complex messages. That's kind of later on in uh, Winter Soldier and Civil War when they try and do more of that stuff. But uh, in this movie, it's very black and white, and that's good for developing the characters early on. Uh, and I feel like the early Marvel films, a lot of them kind of scurried along that same kind of uh, kind of area because it is so easy to develop uh, characters early on when you have a simple story, and then you can make the stories more complex as people get to know the characters. And that, that again, that that that's the sign of good writing, which is what Marvel uh, had back then, which is another reason why they have been so strong up until now. Uh, but we move on from that, and honestly, the action scenes in the movie are are pretty good there uh i wouldn't say they're they're on uh you know obviously they get better as time moves on because you have more superpowers involved and really captain america and red skull are not really um you know it's mostly just hand-to-hand -hand, uh, martial arts style combat nothing too fancy uh but the super strength does add to it and the shield throwing is actually really really funny uh there's actually a scene um in the movie where Captain America, where he has a, a motorcycle, and this is near the, uh, this is in the third act, I believe, or close to the third act, where he uses the motorcycle and he use, he's basically, he's using himself as a distraction. And he uses the motorcycle and like blows up this, uh, the front of this building. And he then proceeds to try, he then proceeds to beat the living hell out of all of these uh, Hydra soldiers that are around the building. And uh, it just watching him throw the shield does a, does a really good scene. Uh, where he throws the shield, he bounces it off a tank, and it hits a guy who's behind the tank uh, with a gun who's about ready to shoot him. And he, he knew the guy was there. He could see him kind of from where he was. So he threw the shield around, bounced it, and hit the guy on the other side of the tank, which, again, it kind of shows uh, that kind of idea with Captain America where he is uh, he's really, really good at throwing that shield. And again, it's kind of like the comic books where in the comic books he is developed, he is uh, basically he's developed it to the point where it's like Batman and a Batarang where he can just hit guys behind stuff and he can bounce the thing. And, uh, they do it to the movie and it's actually pretty believable when they do it. You know, it, it, even though you think about it and it's kind of goofy and stupid, they really, really sell it to you in the film. And uh, that, that's one of the better parts of it is those action scenes, especially with Captain America when he has the shield. Um, and uh, then we go into the latter part of the movie where we kind of get into what is the, uh, you know, the third act and what ultimately is the ending and what leads into the, uh, the what is the post credit scene for the film. And uh, basically the, not to give away too, too much, but basically... Uh, Johann Schmidt's going to blow up the eastern seaboard, and they figure out that he has this giant uh, airship that looks like, basically looks like a B-2 stealth bomber, and Captain America manages to get onto it at the end of the film, and he then, you know, swath the destruction through the ship, you know, takes out as many guys as he can, and finally has his showdown with Johann Schmidt. Now, the main plot line of the film revolves around the Cosmic Cube, which would eventually become the main plot line, well, the main... Uh, the MacGuffin, uh, should I say, for uh, Mar uh, s most of Marvel Phase 1, and it ultimately culminates in the first Avengers film. Uh, but the Cosmic Cube is basically being used to power all of these high-tech weapons that Hydra has, including this giant airship. Uh, so what happens is, is Captain America manages to uh, destroy the uh there's a, a device that's holding the cosmic cube as the power source he manages to destroy it and johann schmidt then proceeds to grab the cosmic cube and gets teleported away in through a space portal uh since the cosmic cube i believe holds the space stone which means you can go from place to place wherever you want and open up portals um and the, the cube then drops to the ground and it burns a hole through the ship and falls down uh through the ship and into the water and uh, we uh, that, that's the last we see of it for a while. We don't see it again, uh, I don't believe, until uh, a certain point. I don't think I think the Thor film is the next time we see the Cosmic Cube in terms of the timeline. Uh, but this uh, unfortunately leaves Captain America in a very bad position because he can't uh, without the power source. The ship is going down. The the, the aircraft is going down. 
and he really uh, doesn't have uh, any way to kind of, he doesn't really have that much, the only thing he can do is basically put it down somewhere where it's not going to hurt anybody. Um, and he's coming towards the uh, the eastern seaboard of the United States. Um, and l let's also keep in mind at this point, uh, Bucky Barnes has been supposedly killed um, in a in a uh, during a battle, so his best friend is essentially dead. And he's talking to Peggy Carter over the radio. Uh, you know, they, they're basically talking back and forth, even though she knows what's about to happen to him, and he kind of knows what's about to happen to him. And this is again, uh, this this goes back to the idea of uh, you know Steve Rogers sacrificing himself for the greater good or for uh, the betterment of other people is the idea that uh, you know he he wants to he doesn't want anybody to get hurt anybody that's innocent and he, he pilots this thing down and he crashes it and that's when they don't show you really the crash they show you right up to it and then they you you hear the radio cut off on uh, Peggy Carter's end and that's kind of uh, the end of it and you know they all think that he's dead and really, he expects to die. You can tell that with it. With you know, Chris Evans does some very good uh, facial acting. You know, he's talking on the radio, but he's really just kind of keeping going. You know, he knows what's about to happen. It, but it, it, it's kind of an interesting scene where it's like you know, there's the impending doom, and and both of the both of the characters know what's coming. And uh, but Chris Evans is kind of going on with this conversation, kind of like uh, you know, you can tell that there's something off, obviously, because he thinks he's going to die. Uh, but he goes off, and this is. You know, he's talking to her about, you know, oh, we're, we're going to go dancing and stuff like that. And then it just cuts and you're like, oh, duh, that's that's bad. Um, but it's a very well done scene and you actually feel for these characters by the end of it because they develop this relationship between him and Peggy Carter over the course of the film so you actually understand like they no, there there was actual caring there it wasn't just like oh you know she's the female so she has to fall in love with them it's you kind of understand that there's a relationship there in some sense uh you know well well before this so you 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 get that idea and the, the, also the film itself takes place over a time frame of what seems to be at least a year maybe more um so you again you you get the idea that this is a relationship that's developed over time and they have genuine affection for one another so then that's what you have there so after the ship crashes then it cuts the black and uh, you kind of get this idea where they show like uh, they show a scene at the end where there's this very kind of patriotic type of music and you see these kids running through uh, the New York streets with a uh, one of them has a trash can lid much like Chris Evans had at the very beginning of the movie in the alleyway scene where he's getting beat up and you see that it has the Captain America star and everything uh, on it. Now uh, I'm just going to flash forward to the very be to back to the very uh, flash back I should say to the very beginning of the movie just for a second because I've been going over most of the stuff that takes place in 1940 or in the 40s uh, because that's where the vast majority of the film takes place. But the the very beginning and the end credit scene both take place in what would be modern day, which would have been 2011 when the film was made. Now, in 2011, uh, the, at the very beginning of the movie, they show that they find the ship in the ice. They find this the giant airship that uh, Chris Evans was flying at the end of the film, or Captain America was flying at the end of the film. And they go in, and they wind up finding the shield. And they, they, they look in, and they find, they find the Captain America shield uh, in the snow. And then it cuts back to the 1940s, and then you see the movie. Now, the end credit scene goes back and you see Chris Evans wake up in a bed and you think it's the 1940s because you hear there's a Dodgers game on the radio and uh, you, you there's a woman in a nurse's outfit and she has uh, you know she has a, a, a patch on there from uh, I forget I think it's US Air Force and uh, you know Chris Evans wakes up and uh, it, everything in the room tells you that it is you know it's still 1944. But uh, here's the thing with the scene, is that, again, this kind of harkens back to the, uh, the the scene with the flagpole, where you get to see kind of Steve Rogers' intelligence. And uh, Steve Rogers, uh, you know, he gets up and he's immediately suspicious of what's happening, uh, where you look, he looks around and, uh, you know, the nurse asks him what's wrong and he says, where am I? And she, she says where he is, but he says, no, I'm not. Uh, and... Uh, he said that he, he basically says the, the, the baseball game that he's listening to, which I think he says is Yankees and Dodgers. Uh, he says it was uh, the date in the actual date that the game took place. And he says, I know because I was there. 
So <laughs> apparently the people at Shield are morons and didn't realize that the uh, uh, the baseball game that they uh, they broadcast was actually from like two years before Captain America crashed the plane. Uh, which is kind of funny, but Captain America then proceeds to break out of the little uh, playroom that he's in, which has like cardboard walls and stuff like that. It's in this secure area, and then he manages to get away from the shield security and runs out into Times Square. And this is when we have kind of the moment in the film where you have his like shock and awe moment, like he has no idea what's going on now. And uh, Nick Fury, uh, or Sam Jackson as Nick Fury then shows up and says, Captain, you have entered into a very different world. And basically the, the idea that, uh, you know, they were trying to kind of keep him insulated until they could expose him to the real world slowly, but he basically shell-shocked himself. Um, and that's kind of, that's after the end credits scene, that's how the movie ends. And uh, really this, the first Captain America movie is one of my favorite MCU films. And uh, it, it's one of my favorite MCU films because Captain America, the series itself, is probably the best trilogy uh, out of the MCU movies. And it really does, it works very well, and it, it, it does one of the better jobs of establishing a character that we all kind of think of as, as a little bit silly. You know, Captain America doesn't really come off, uh, you know, in the comic books, you know, it's believable because it's, it's a comic book. You can do a lot of kind of insane things in a comic book. Uh, but... When you when, to pull it off in a movie is is extremely challenging, and they did it in a great way, and they continued to do it uh, to make him a relatable and uh, to make him a relatable character, which is kind of uh, interesting. And then, of course, you know, in the future movies, we have uh, the timeline where you know he's a man out of time. You know, he jumped essentially he jumped uh, seventy years into the future. Uh, you know, when you think about that, like all of your friends are either incredibly old or dead and, you know, a bunch of other stuff. And, and I'll go into that when I go into the later Captain America films. But this is uh, really one of my favorite and uh, it, it's really near the top. And as far as the rating, um, you know, I'm going to kind of do a, a, a u bit of a unique rating system uh, for each one of these films. And Captain America, the first Avenger, I will give it eight and a half shields. <laughs> out of 10. Uh, so we finish with that and the next film uh, in the series will be uh, Captain Marvel and I will be going to go see that uh, this Friday. Hopefully I can buy a ticket to another movie and sneak in but we will see. Um, and uh, as far as my ranking of MCU films uh, you'll see the card on the screen in a minute but Captain America ranks number two for me out of the many MCU films. I believe there is 22 of them. Uh, well, 21 before Endgame. Um, so we're starting off really high. So let's see where Captain Marvel falls on this list uh, next time, which I will try to get that review out on Saturday. Uh, so thank you again for watching. Uh, leave in the comments what you think about Captain America the First Avenger. Did you like it? Did you think it was mad? Did you not like it? Um, you know, hit the like button, hit the uh, bell for notifications, subscribe, and remember, I live my life free of compromise. Do you?